Working with software risk management can get, well, tricky. There are many different things you can easily confuse, and the best thing to do is learn about them beforehand. So, welcome! I'm Christian Kessner, and you are watching a video that is part of my course on Software for Medical Devices and IEC 6234. You can find it in our other courses at medicaldevicehq.com or by simply following the link from the video description below. Do you want to make sure you always see new content from us? Subscribe and click the notifications button then. So, ready? Let's go! Software risk management is often associated with a lot of pain. Usually, the pain comes for three reasons. The first is lack of understanding in how to manage probability of software failures. Secondly, risk assessment templates are usually not tailored to manage software risks. And lastly, something that really can confuse people. It is the difference between software risk controls and risk controls implemented by software. In this video, you will learn how to deal with these obstacles. Let's start and clear up the confusion about software risk controls and risk controls implemented by software. The wordings are similar, but the meaning is quite different. Risk controls implemented by software, that is, when the software is used to reduce the probability of harm for functionality outside of the software itself. For example, the goods coming out from a steam sterilizer are very hot and can cause burns to operators. To minimize the risk of harm, the software can prompt a warning on a user interface. This is a risk control measure, but it's not a software risk control measure. And this is what confused many. The software now implements a functionality which happens to be a risk control measure, but not a software risk control measure. So what is then a software risk control measure? A software risk control measure is used to reduce the likelihood that a failure within the software can contribute to a hazardous situation. If we assume that the steam sterilizer warning is an important one, then we should assess if we can add a software risk control measure to that functionality. This could, for example, be adding priorities in the software, ensuring that the warning will always be displayed on top of other messages. So, risk control measures implemented by software are used to reduce risks outside the software, such as the steam sterilizer warning. Software risk control measures, on the other hand, are reducing the likelihood of failures within the software, for example, safeguarding that the warning is appearing on the screen when expected. The scope of software risk management, as defined by IEC 6234, is about software risk controls in your software. This may sound like twisting words, but you should distinguish between software risk control and risk controls implemented by software to avoid confusing yourself or others when working with software risk management. Now let's continue with the probability of software failure and get that terminology right. Software risk management is about how to reduce the likelihood that the software can contribute to hazardous situations, which is all about reducing P1. Onwards, throughout this video and in other videos, when I talk about software risk management, P1 is what I have in mind. During your software risk management work, you might find a situation where you would like to add risk control measures to reduce the likelihood of harm occurring, and that is P2. Such a risk control measure is likely to be outside of the software and should preferably be documented in your system risk analysis. The mindset when starting with software risk management is to assume that software failure always occur. The reason for this is that it is very difficult and maybe even impossible to estimate the probability of a software failure. Some interpret this as the probability of occurrence of harm, which is PO, should be set to 100% and that's entirely wrong. Such assumption implies that a failure always will occur and it will always lead to harm. I doubt that any device is that bad, or at least I'm convinced that no, no one would release a product which is not working, right? Now let's leave this incorrect assumption and focus on P1 instead. The starting point for a software risk analysis is to assume that we have the worst software ever and it will always contribute to a hazardous situation. The good thing with this negative attitude 
is that there's a lot of room for improvement. Software risk management is all about finding ways and methods to reduce the likelihood of P1. You reduce the likelihood of failure by taking actions that you believe minimize the probability of failure. These actions are software risk control measures. By introducing a software risk control measure, you reduce the likelihood of a software failure. It may be difficult to estimate how efficient a software risk control measure is. Still, I believe we can agree that doing something is better than doing nothing. For now, we just say it will be less than 100%. The first step when working with risk control measures is to figure out what can go wrong. In other words, identify potential causes for software failures. Your working assumption should be, the more you understand, the safer your software will become. Working with identification of causes is like answering the question, how long is a piece of string? There's no definitive answer about how much you need to do. But if there is a severe issue with your software and someone gets hurt, or even worse. You don't want to sit there knowing that you could have done more. So what can you do? IEC 6234 heavily refers to software items when talking about software risk management. However, from a general risk management perspective, I recommend you looking in three different places when searching for software risk control measures. You will now get a brief introduction to all three, but there's more to learn about each of them in dedicated videos. First, you can ask yourself, what can you do in your development process to reduce the likelihood of failure? A well-established process is there to reduce the likelihood of mistakes and failures. And to be honest, I even have a checklist when I travel because I have forgotten my toothbrush too many times. A development process based on IEC 62304, class B or C, is a risk control measure on its own. But for class A software, there are no requirements for software risk management, which makes the value of such a process questionable. Secondly, what are your options on the software system level to reduce the likelihood of a software to fail? Simplified, you can say this is often related to architectural design. On a software system level, you can deal with causes which are applicable to several software items and causes. For example, if a risk is related to processing speed, then you could define system requirements assuring that you are guaranteed sufficient CPU power. This would then be a hardware requirement implementing a risk control measure on behalf of the software. You will learn more about this option in other videos, especially in the architectural design, where you also find requirements about segregation necessary for risk control. Lastly, what actions can you take on software items. When you're working with risk control measures at software item level, it is often related to adding functionality to the source code, such as protecting data with checksums. The trickier thing here is that adding more source code also means that more things can go wrong. So obviously, spreading software risk control measures all around the software just because you can does not necessarily have to be a good thing. When working with software risk management, your goal is to reduce the likelihood of failure within the software, and you have several options to achieve this. There is, of course, nothing holding you back to combine risk controls from all three alternatives. If you combine several risk controls, it is logical to assume that the likelihood of failure will become lower. You're free to multiply as many numbers as you want to, but be careful here. If you multiply many small numbers, you will end up with zero. But we are talking about software, and I argue that regardless of the numbers of software risk controls you implement, there's always a remaining risk. So to avoid making your software risk assessment work looking ridiculous, I suggest you define the lowest possible P1 you should use, regardless of how many values you multiply. This can, for example, be documented in your risk management plan or software development plan. Speaking of documentation, Maybe you have asked yourself how to work with this in a hazard trace matrix, often referred to as HTM. Let's have a look at how it can be integrated into a hazard trace matrix. A typical HTM includes the following elements. Hazard, reasonable foreseeable sequence or combination of events. Hazard situation, harm, probability of occurrence, which is PO, severity shortened to S and a conclusion whether the risk is acceptable or not. 
But when working with software, we shouldn't be too happy about only finding PO in the matrix. We want more. If you work a lot with software, you should expand the matrix to also include P1 and P2. PO can then be based on a combination of P1 and P2. You can choose if you want to use this approach only for software-related risks, but there is certainly no harm in using this approach to all your risk management work. Perhaps it's just me getting old, but I often struggle to remember the rationale behind the numbers. When this happens, comments are invaluable. Comments does not need to appear in the formal documentation and can be hidden. If you work in Excel, it, you can easily hide comment columns in the formal version of your document. I will now show you how to expand the risk analysis section of an HDM. The same logic applies to the risk control section. You simply just add two more columns to include P1 and P2. I will now walk you through a made-up example and show what a HDM could look like when implementing P1 and P2. The example is about a software controlling an air pump, which is used to help patients to breathe. In other words, a type of ventilator. The software control parameters get corrupted and cause the pump to run at a high speed. This results in a hazard situation where the lungs can be exposed to high air pressure and potentially result in serious injury. We assume that the software failure always will happen and that it's P1 equals 1. And since it is an example, P2 has been given a random number. Based on a multiplication of P1 and P2, you can now calculate PO and convert it into a semi-quantity number, which is commonly used for PO. In our example, P1 multiplied with P2 equals 1000. The next step is then to use the value to look up your semi-quantity value for PO. In this example, we get the value of 5. And please note, the probability numbers might look different in your organization, but the principles are likely to be the same. And this disclaimer also applies to the evaluation matrix I will show you now. The numbers and colors might be different, but the logic should still be there. For our example, we know that the values for PO is 5 and the severity equals 5. This drives us to the conclusion that the risk is not acceptable. So a quick summary of the steps we just made. You multiply P1 and P2 and the resulting number is easily used to determine a semi-quantity value for PO. With help of PO and the severity, you can determine whether the risk is acceptable or not. I will now switch to the other side of the HDM and you will be confronted with a lot of text. I will not take you through all the information and you don't have to read everything. But if you want to, feel free to hit the pause button. In the risk control part of the HDM, you find risk control option analysis, risk control measures, verification of effectiveness, if risk control measures are implemented, and then we have P1 and P2. As you can see, it looks the same as it did in the risk analysis section, but now P1 has got a lower number. The reduction of P1 is a result of the risk control measures implemented. If you want to aim for perfection, you could assign a risk reduction number to each risk control measure and then combine them into a single P1. However, it quickly becomes complicated and you might end up in endless discussion about numbers instead of focusing on the big picture, which is designing a safe product. So here I recommend you using common sense, evaluate the combination of available risk control measures and assign a meaningful number to P1. You have now reached the end of this video and you have learned how to integrate P1 and P2 in an HDM. In the beginning of this video, you also learned that you could find inspiration to reduce P1 from various sources, such as your software development process, risk reduction on software system level, and lastly, risk control measures implemented in software items. So, did you enjoy our lesson? Let me know what you think in the comments. I love seeing you there. If you want to be the first to know what's new, go ahead and follow us on LinkedIn at Medical Device HQ. Now, try to get your probabilities right and I'll see you in the next video. Thanks for watching.